We are in for a treat today. Has anything bad ever happened to you and because of it you got to do something good? Like I remember when I was a kid, I got my tonsils out. Did you know after you get your tonsils out, you can eat ice cream every meal for a week? Well, today you're going to have some ice cream because of something bad that happened to me. I hurt my back this week and, and uh, was in pretty rough shape for the past couple of days and wasn't even sure I was going to be able to stand up today. Uh, I'm glad I'm able to be here and I'm in a little bit of pain, but I'm able to, to at least smile and, and stand still. Uh, but I knew that there was a chance I wouldn't be in any shape to be standing up today and wouldn't be in any shape to be bringing you a word from the Lord. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, Jordan Smith, who is planting a church just like we did a little over a year ago. He's doing the same exact thing in West Fork. And I am excited about what they're doing. I've gotten to be part of a little bit of the remodel that they're doing on their building down there. And uh, we have partnered with them to purchase that big movie screen that we use so that we can do movies in the park. He's already done three or four of those events down at the park in West Fork. And I'm excited about what God has in store for West Fork for that community through Jordan and Morgan. And uh, I reached out to Jordan and said, hey, man, uh, I may need someone to preach this weekend. Are you available? And he said, I'm not only available, I've got the sermon ready. Let's do it. So I said, man, I would love it. So if you would, uh, just let's, let's show Jordan how much we appreciate him being here today as he comes. Thank you, guys. Put all my 500 things down here. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for allowing me to be here with you guys. I love this church. Um, you know, uh, being part of a church plant, we don't necessarily have a home church or somewhere we go to regularly every Sunday. But this, uh, we've actually only been here twice now. This is our second time, and we love it. Um, you guys are so welcoming, so loving, and uh, it just, uh, it's a really comfortable place to worship with. So thank you guys for allowing Morgan and I to be here. Uh, we love it. Thank you, Pastor Brian and uh, Pastor Christina, for allowing us to be here. Um, your pastors are amazing. I, I want to just, let's take a few moments and let's just give some thanks to our pastors this morning. Um, they have been uh, not just uh, amazing friends to us, but they've come alongside of us and helped us uh, in many ways um, that we needed in some ways we didn't realize we would need during this time a church plant. Um, uh, church planting can be hard, it can be lonely, but when someone walks beside you who's been through it, uh, who's, who's been in those same steps, who's had that same time of loneliness, that same amount of worry, uh, it just helps a lot to see where they're at today. It helps to see where you guys have grown to and uh, that you guys are actually a church now. When, when, when we go to our Wednesday night small groups, and I remember the first few meetings we had, uh, they were launch team meetings, and Morgan and I sat down, and it would start at 6, and 6.10 would come, and it would still be me and Morgan just waiting. I'd cooked a big meal for whoever showed up, 6.15, and she'd be like, well, you want to go back to the house now? <laughs> I'd be like, yep. <laughs> Uh, we needed people to come alongside of us and just remind us how faithful God is and what he can do, what only he can do. Um, today, I'm going to be reading out of John chapter 9. So if you want to go ahead and uh, make your way to John chapter 9. Um, we're going to be talking about the man who was born blind. Um, thank you again, Centerpoint Church, for allowing me to be here. Uh, it, it takes a lot sometimes for a pastor to hand over their microphone. In this case, it, it was an injury. So uh, we'll keep praying for Pastor Brian as he's going through this. Uh, and um, just, just excited to be here. Today, we're going to be reading out of John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Um, if you want to just follow along, I'm going to read a little bit and then uh, uh, just summarize a bit. We're, but we're actually going to step through the entire chapter today. So let's start in verse chapter 1. And as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. So this is talking about Jesus. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. 
And as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. But night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse six, it goes on. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and he washed and he came home seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging ask, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, only he looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. And verse 10 says, how then were your eyes open? They demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to, uh, to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I do not know, he said. So the scripture actually goes on, and his neighbors bring him before the religious leaders of that time, the Pharisees, and they ask him a question. It's, it's actually quite funny, uh, a little depressing, actually. The, the, the question they ask isn't, how are you necessarily healed? It's, who was the man who healed you because he actually healed you on the Sabbath? Isn't it crazy to see how the religious leaders of the time didn't focus on the miracle that had taken place, but instead they had focused on a legalistic law. They chose to focus instead of on the work of God on something that bothered them. Isn't it crazy to see how church people can sometimes be that way? Isn't it, isn't it weird to see how uh, some churches that we've been in in our lives can instead of focusing on the great works of God that are happening, can instead uh, obsess over the things they want to happen or the things that have been happening because of tradition in their churches. That's what I love so much about church plants. We get to come in, we get to say, okay, that is an awesome church tradition. We can keep that going or maybe we can phase that out and we can just focus on the miracles and on the works of God that he's doing in people's lives and we don't have to worry about the other things. I, I just think that's awesome. So the Pharisees, they see this man, they ask him, who healed you? And of course, the blind man, he was blind when it happened. All he knew was that this was Jesus. This is what happened. I, 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 I got mud splattered on my eyes. Someone spoke to me. I went and washed. I could see. So they actually call this man's parents in and they ask him, okay, tell us, is this your son? Was he born blind and what happened? And his parents went on to say, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. Obviously he can see now we have no idea what happened. And in fact, they were actually afraid to tell the truth because during this uh, particular time, it was uh, unlawful to admit that the man named Jesus could possibly be the Messiah. And anyone who would do so in a public place could be excommunicated. So naturally the parents were like, no, 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 I'm not having any part of this. So they go on and they ask the man again. In verse 24, it says a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. And they said to him, they said, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner, talking about Jesus. And in verse 25, this is my favorite part of this. He says, he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you for this church and for its pastors. Lord, we lift you up in this room this morning, God, that as I speak, God, it wouldn't be words of my own heart or my own mind, but it would be words directly of heaven. God, that as they pour out of me, God, they would touch the hearts and the minds of your people and someone today would leave here transformed by the truth of your word. Father, we lift up this church and its pastors to you. Lord, that you would continuously pour out your blessings and your favor upon it. God, that at every need and at every circumstance or situation, you will step in and you will come through and you will provide and you will be our God. We trust in you today for what only you can do and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture continues on in verses 26 through 34. They actually end up getting in an argument with this man. Uh, and he is, they're more adamant about the fact that you're lying or publicly we need you to lie. And he's more adamant about the fact like, this is what happened. Jesus healed me. And actually at the end of uh, uh, verse 34, they do end up throwing him out. They end up what we call excommunicating him. And the, the scripture goes on in verse 35, and it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. 
And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This narrative is an amazing testimony of who Jesus is. Not who, just who Jesus was, but of who Jesus is today. This portion of scripture shows the compassion of Jesus through this, the healing of a man who was born blind. But I think it shows us something else today. It shows us a, a process that all of us are on, that all of us have started hopefully and all of us are on in our own journey from our own blindness to our own sight, in our own journey from our own darkness to us stepping in to the light. You see, this is the first time in all of biblical record that someone who was born blind is given sight. The first time in all of scripture, from Genesis to John, there hasn't been a prophet, a priest, an apostle. No one has ever healed anything, but anyone before this time of blindness. This is the first time. So this actually makes this hugely significant when it comes to the scriptures. And it goes to show why the Pharisees were so upset, why they were so adamant about this man telling the truth of how he was healed. Uh, opening the eyes of the blind was prophesied in the, in the Old Testament, in the, in the prophet Isaiah. In his words, he told us that someone would come. A Messiah would step in one day, and one of the things he would do is heal someone of blindness. And it's no doubt that the Pharisees had read those texts. It's no doubt that most of them had probably memorized those words. So you can see why they were so upset. In Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah tells us this. He says, he will come. Speaking of the Messiah, he says, he will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. They knew these words very, very well. And, and if this was true, what the, what the man who had been born blind was saying, if it was true, the man they kept coming against could, in fact, be the king that they had been waiting on. That's crazy to think about. You see, uh, there, there are some other awesome theological uh, significant portions to this word, to this chapter. And I, 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 I say this in almost every sermon, and I'm going to say it again. I'm sure my wife gets tired of hearing it. Uh, but... I want to encourage you guys, read the scriptures. Uh, a lot of the times when we come in as new Christians, uh, or, or maybe we've been Christians our whole life, so we know the Bible, we don't take our own time to sit down and just read. But when you do that, you allow the Holy Spirit to pour into you, to teach you new things, to show you some awesome things. Because not only is every word inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I truly believe that even the layout of some of these chapters is inspired by God. He, he led the writing of this. You see, Scripture isn't an accident. In John chapter 5, just a few chapters before this, we see a lame man who is healed, a man who couldn't walk. Jesus goes up to, he stands up, he doesn't just walk, he runs in, worshiping to the temple, dancing, shouting, screaming in joy. We see Jesus tell someone who had been lame for 38 years, someone who had been waiting, someone who had been expecting, Jesus comes in and tells him, stand up. And then what we just saw in chapter 9, we see a man born blind be given sight. Theologically, these can represent the two groups of people that Jesus came to save. The first, in chapter 5, we see the blind or uh, the lame man represents the Jews, those who had been waiting those who had been expecting, those who'd been trying and trying and trying all by themselves to gain salvation, but realizing they could never do it themselves and they had to wait on Jesus to come in, to step in and tell them to stand up. And then in chapter 9, the blind man represents the rest of the world, represents us, the Gentiles, those who possibly didn't even know that they could be healed of their blindness. But Jesus came in anyway and said, Open your eyes and see. I, I think that's powerful how scripture does this. And another significant part of this scripture is the word Siloam. The word Siloam, the pool of Siloam means scent. 
And all throughout John's testimony, he actually uses this word uh, to refer to Jesus, the one who was sent. And I I think it's really cool that uh, after again and again, he refers to Jesus being sent. Now blindness is removed with reference to and with the aid of the one who has been sent. And uh, again, I want to encourage you, read through scripture, pull out these little things because God can reveal some impactful truths in your life. But let's take a look at the story itself. One of the first things I see is the reaction of the disciples. One of the first things I see is uh, how did they react with the man when they first saw him? They asked Jesus a question. They say this, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. They weren't necessarily being rude or, or mean. It, it, it was that. But you got to understand in this culture, they truly believed that most of the time when something bad happens to someone, it's because of a sin in their lives. Or in this case, they also believed maybe it was in his parents' lives. What did his parents do against God that caused their child to be born blind? So they asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? He was born blind. You see, the disciples did not see this man as someone they could help. Instead, they regarded him as a, more of an unsolved riddle. They regarded him as a question, who sinned? They show no interest in helping this man right away, but only in discussing what caused his condition. But church, I want to tell you, Jesus came not only to change our lives, to change our outward actions, but he came to transform what's happening up here. You see, he didn't come just to pull you out of that one-time situation or that addiction. He came to transform your mind so you would no longer crave that addiction. That's who Jesus is, and that's what he does. You see, he didn't dwell on a theological puzzle that was sitting in front of him, but he actually focused on helping the man. That was Jesus' first reaction. The disciples' first reaction was, who is this man? Why did he sin? But Jesus' first reaction was to kneel down and help him. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, and I love this quote. He said, it is ours not to speculate. It is ours not to speculate, but to perform acts of mercy and of love according to the tenor of the gospel. Let us be then less inquisitive and more practical, less for cracking doctrinal nuts and more for bringing forth the bread of life to the starving multitudes. That's that's powerful. How often do we become like the disciples in this situation? I want you guys to think about that. How often do you become the person that instead of stepping in and helping someone right away, you're the person who starts to ask questions of how that person got there? How often do we see someone suffering? And instead of focus on what we can do as followers of Christ, we focus on what did they do to get there? And I've, I've heard it so many times. Well, if he hadn't started doing that, if he hadn't started drinking or partying, he wouldn't be where he's at. If she hadn't started dating that particular guy when I told her not to, maybe she wouldn't be in the situations that she's in. You see, we like to point the question to why the person is where they are. But Jesus pointed the question away from the why and on to the idea of what can God do? What can only God do in this? You see, You got to see when this man was a little boy, you got to think about his background. He heard all these Pharisees, his friends, his friend's parents say, "Mm, I wonder what his parents did. I wonder why he's blind. I wonder what he's doing. You know, I wonder what sin. And he had heard this all his life. He probably asked the question, why me? Why can't I see? Why was I born this way? What did I do? What did my parents do? Why was I born blind? But what I love about God is how he can use these times. He can use your hard times to show you exactly who he is. Because you see, God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness so that that when the child grew up to be an adult, he might, by the recovering of his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
It took a long time for him to come out of this, but he got to come out of it seeing and hearing the voice of Jesus Christ. And because it took so long, those around him got to see the glory of God and the truth of who the truth was and how the truth had finally come. And I think, I think that's incredible. And if you're, if you're paying attention, if you're taking notes today, I want, I want to share this first thought with you. And it's, it's pretty basic, it's pretty simple, and a lot of you will be like, well, duh. But sometimes, as Christians, we overlook this. It doesn't matter how you got here. It matters how God can bring you out of it. It, it doesn't matter how we got to where we are. It matters that God can pull us out of it. It doesn't matter how you stepped into that addiction. He says sometimes we dwell so much on how we got to where we are that we forget to chase after Jesus and allow him to pull us out of that darkness. It doesn't matter how you got into that sin. It doesn't matter how you got into that relationship or started hanging out with those group of people. What matters is how Jesus can bring you out of it. But that's, that's, that's not the only part of this because when God was laying this on my heart, I want you to know, when I write these sermons, Jesus doesn't just give me the words to speak for the people. He gives me words that are for me too. He likes to work on me quite a bit. And this, this really convicted me because while it's easy to say it doesn't matter how we got here, sometimes it's harder to say it doesn't matter how they got there. It doesn't matter how they got there. It matters how Jesus can bring them out. Or even, even this, it doesn't matter how they got there. It matters how Jesus can use you to bring them out of it. It doesn't matter how they got there. It doesn't matter how your son or your daughter fell into that sin. It doesn't matter how your brother or your sister or your mother or your father chose that over God. What matters is that Jesus can use you to bring them out. But church, we have to stop discussing what has happened. In easier words, we have to let it go. We have to stop discussing, stop trying to find someone to blame. We have to stop focusing on why it happened and instead on what glory can be brought to God through the situation. And and, and I want to move on, but we... We really need to take hold of this and understand it because I've seen it in my family my entire life. Um, Some of the older generation, my grandma, I'll be honest with you, she's not here. My grandma can be really hard on people in this type of way. She's quick to pray. She loves Jesus. I know that. Okay, there's, there's nothing wrong with her in that aspect. But as soon as she sees someone in our family fall into sin, instead of praying right away, Instead of sharing the love of Jesus with them right away, she instead, mm, well, I told them they'd be there. Mm, well, I don't know if I want to help them because they're just going to go back into it. But church, it doesn't matter how they got here. What matters is that God can use you to help them out of that situation. It doesn't matter how they got there. But let's keep, let's keep moving because there's a little more truth to pull from this scripture. You see, the, the journey that the blind man goes on is very, very important. He went from not knowing who Jesus was to declaring that Jesus was God and, in fact, worshiping at his feet. That's crazy. Over the course of probably a day of a few hours of one chapter, we see This man goes from, I have no idea who healed me, to worshiping that man at his feet. Our relationship with Jesus is a journey, and each of us are in different places on that journey. And I want you to know this today. You should never feel inadequate for where you are with Jesus. Never feel inadequate for where you are in your journey with Jesus. Instead, turn focus to who Jesus is and to what he has done in your life. Never feel inadequate. In verse 10, the neighbors ask, oh, I love the neighbors in this story. And I love this, this little part uh, where he goes back to his neighbors and they're like, hey, isn't that the guy who was blind? And some of them are like, no, 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 that's not him. That, that doesn't look like him. Isn't it crazy to see that after one interaction with Jesus, this man came back and the people who live daily lives with him didn't recognize him? 
Isn't, uh, isn't that great? Let me ask you a question. When you have an interaction with Jesus and you go to your workplace, you go to your house, do people recognize you? Because if they see the same person who was, they saw before the interaction with Jesus, maybe that interaction wasn't everything that God wanted it to be in your life. See, this guy, he, he didn't even see Jesus. He heard his voice. He was touched by his hands. And when he went back to the people who should recognize him, they were like, whoa, 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 who's that? that I don't know if that's him. That can't be him. Something is different about that guy. When you step out of a church service, when you step out of a worship service, do you go out a changed person? Because if not, maybe something's happening, something's wrong. Okay, and, and I've, I've asked the question several times. Well, I'm sure there's someone in the room who is praying every day who loves Jesus, but God can grow in our lives no matter if we're a, I don't know if you want to put a number on it, a zero in a relationship with Jesus or a 10 in a relationship with Jesus. God can take you to a one and God can take you to an 11. It doesn't matter. God can still change your life. So when you step out, people don't recognize the person that you are because the person you were before has been transformed by the power of God. That's what happens to this blind man. He doesn't even know what's going on, but that's what's happening to him. And they say to him, they said, how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. They asked him where Jesus was at, and he said, I have no idea. You see, at this point, this man knew very little about Jesus. He didn't know much about him. He didn't know Jesus was from Nazareth uh, or that he was the Messiah or, or he claimed to be God or the light of the world. He had no clue where Jesus was actually even staying. No idea. All he knew was his name and that he had healed him. He had never seen Jesus. He had just heard his voice. But if we continue to follow the journey of this man, we see in verse 17, the man actually changes his answer. See, the first time they say, who did this? And he said, the man, Jesus. But in verse 17, it, he takes a step forward and he said, he is a prophet. When he's speaking to the Pharisees, he says, he is a prophet. What we see here is that this man has grown in his understanding and in his proclamation of Jesus. He's grown. He's grown. He's on this journey, and he has grown. And you see, I, I've said it a few minutes ago, but this was dangerous for him. Because the, the journey that God was taking him on was leading him down a path where he was about to get kicked out of the church, where he was about to be rejected. He would be thrown out of the temple. He would not be allowed to worship. However, in the face of persecution, we see the man transform dramatically because of what Jesus did. And church, I believe the attitude of the blind man is the same attitude we should carry with us every single day, especially when we don't have all the answers, especially when we don't know. And, and I, I talked about it earlier, but they actually call his parents in. <laughs> and they, they, they tell the truth. This is my son. He was blind, but they don't, they don't want to be excommunicated. So the Pharisees actually say to the, him, they say, give glory to God. They command this man, give glory to God. And what they mean by this is either stop lying and tell us what actually happened or start lying and refuse to tell the truth that Jesus is God, that you have been healed by him. And at this point, he replies, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, and now I stand here seeing. Church, when you don't have all the answers, when you don't know why things happen like they did, turn your focus to the truth that you do know. When you don't know, turn your focus to heaven. Never feel inadequate as a Christian because you didn't go to a Bible college or you didn't study in a seminary or, or you're not as smart as someone else. Never feel inadequate. Never feel like you can't share your faith or you can't share the gospel because you don't know enough. You see, this man didn't know everything. He nearly knew anything about Jesus, but he did know that Jesus had touched his life and now he can see. That's what he knew. And at that moment, this, this case became an irrefutable argument. 
See, they couldn't argue against what Jesus did in this man's life because it was standing right there, staring them in the face. They couldn't argue with it. At that moment, they took a stand on their preconceived ideas, and he took a stand on simple facts. At that moment, they took a stand on what they wanted to believe, and he took his stand on what he knew was truth, on who he knew was truth. And his journey continues. You see, We as Christians, we as followers of Christ, we're often confronted with questions that we don't know the answers to. Whether it's someone who's trying to embarrass or mock us or someone who's sincerely asking a question and we have no idea how to answer. And sometimes the easiest thing is talk to my pastor or uh, uh, let me go Google it. That's fine too. Sometimes we don't know the answers. But church, we don't need to be experts in all things. We don't need to have the answer to every question. More than anything, we may simply say, I don't know. But what I do know is I was blind and now I can see. And sometimes that is enough. Sometimes that's all you need. I don't know the answer to your question. What I know is that yesterday my entire body was filled with cancer and today I'm cancer free. I, I, I don't know the answer. But, but yesterday I went to a service where I was prayed over in my wheelchair and now I'm standing up dancing and worshiping God. I don't have the answers, but yesterday I stood in a whole lot of darkness and today I'm walking in the light. You see, you don't have to be a theological scholar. You don't have to give them a a, a 30-page thesis on the gospel. All you have to say is, this is who I was, this is who Jesus is, and this is who I am now. Never feel inadequate. Never feel like you don't have enough because you have everything you need when you allow Jesus to transform your life. Never feel inadequate. Our attitude must reflect this attitude every single day that we step out into the world. In church, we cannot become the ones who judge. We can't become the Pharisees. You know, uh, I don't know uh, most of you guys, and I don't pretend to, and I'm sure none of you are like this, but what Morgan and I have seen in the last church we were in and what we've seen trying to plant a church with some of the, the, the people who used to go to the old uh, West Fort Church isn't the attitude of the blind man. Isn't the attitude of Jesus. It's the attitude of the Pharisees. Those who judge people. We can't become the ones who judge someone who was, who was a druggie yesterday who claims to be a Christ today, a Christ follower today. We can't judge those who, who, who were on the street being a prostitute yesterday and now stand before us and say, no, I want to be with Jesus today. Because it's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy to say, I saw you yesterday. Just yesterday, I saw you giving your life to sin. And today, you're claiming to want to be a follower of Christ. We can never reach that point because that is the point where tro- church growth will stunt. Okay, that's the point where I've seen churches. They've been doing awesome. They've been reaching out to God. They've been reaching out to the people around them, seeing people healed, uh, feeding people when they're hungry, healing people when they're sick. And then someone comes in. Someone comes in and starts to spread this attitude, this pharisaical attitude. And for some reason, we as Christians follow along with it. And we say, well, maybe they're right. Maybe we shouldn't pour into that person. Maybe we shouldn't trust that person. And then church growth stops because Jesus sees the hearts of his people and he realizes if I can't use them, I'm going to go use another church. Never become that church. Never become the people who judge someone based upon where they're at in their journey with God. Never, ever become the people who were like the Pharisees, but instead hold on to the attitude of this blind man. And you see, we must understand that all of us, every single person in this room is in a different place in our walk with God. Okay? And that's been hard for me coming in as a church planter. 
That's been, I, I grew up uh, in a non-denominational church where uh, rules and legalism was very, 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 almost too lax for me, especially as a teenager. And I made a lot of bad decisions. And then I, I stepped into uh, the assemblies of God where I surrounded myself, and I needed this, I surrounded myself with people who were further along in this journey than I was. And sanct ongoing sanctification was uh, then allowed to take place in my heart and in my life. But I think I've spent almost too long in that because now I step out to people who, who in West Fork because I'm not trying to get the people in West Fork who already go to a church. I'm trying to get the ones who, who have forgotten how much they're loved. I'm trying to get the ones who've never stepped foot into a church because there are those people in Northwest Arkansas. I'm trying to reach those people so when I go to them and, and when, they, when they tell a, a dirty joke or they're, they're cussing up a storm or they're talking about partying this last weekend, my first reaction is almost to judge them. See, this, this sermon's for me too. But then God reminds me, stop. Stop questioning me. Stop judging me. And instead, do what I ask you to do and share the love of Christ with every single person you meet. And watch that person Go from, from someone who doesn't know God and watch them take those baby steps further and further into the relationship with Jesus. Watch them and walk beside them, but never, ever judge them. And as we continue on with this journey with the blind man, we see that he goes from someone who had no idea who Jesus was to kneeling at Jesus' feet, worshiping him. And he, he actually argues with the Pharisees, not giving a care of what will happen to him because he's latched onto the truth, he's chosen it, and now he's going to start chasing it. We must be the same way. We must say, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter what I have to do. It doesn't matter what relationships I have to cut or organizations I have to step out of. What matters today is I know the truth, and now I'm choosing to chase after the truth. Church, you will never have all the answers. You will never have all the answers. A, a, a student, um, I, I was a youth pastor for a while, and one of our old students visited me this um, past week to help me do some work on the church and just hang out with me. Uh, he drove from across the state. And he was asking me about my time before I was his youth pastor, and I, when I was an even younger youth pastor. Uh, and he actually uh, started reading through some of my notes from one of my sermons I've given, and he's like, wow, you were not a very good preacher then. And I was like, well, that's rude, first of all. He's a very blunt guy, though, so you got to understand. He's like, no, what I mean is your way, you know much more about the Bible now. Yeah, I do. But church, you got to understand, this didn't just happen. This didn't just, I didn't wake up one morning and I knew everything about John chapter 9. I still don't know everything about John chapter 9. In fact, I, I, I was studying for this sermon and I went visited a church a couple weeks ago and the youth pastor got on stage and he mentioned part of this scripture that was way better than anything I said in John chapter 9. I was like, man, see, I don't even know it all. We'll never have all the answers, but what we do have is what Jesus has done in our lives. What we do know is that once we, we were in that depression and in that dark place. God has brought us out, and that's all you need. And now it's time to step out and to share it. You should never feel inadequate. You should never feel inadequate. And, and I love how this, this chapter actually ends. And we see what we see is that uh, uh, because of his decision to proclaim that Jesus is God, he's excommunicated, and a narrative that began with the compassion of Jesus actually ends with the compassion of Jesus. I love that. I love how the Holy Spirit wrapped this in a, a, a compassion sandwich. I don't know what you want to call it, okay? <laughs> what began with Jesus showing compassion and love first ends with Jesus showing compassion and love. The scripture says this. It says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? See, it doesn't say Jesus heard they threw him out and then Jesus took a week. 
It doesn't say Jesus heard they threw him out, but he finished up with his disciples first, the teachings, and then he went. No, it says Jesus heard, and there's no hesitation. There's no questioning or doubting or waiting. There's no uh, background check on this guy first. It says Jesus heard, and when he had found him, Jesus went straight to him when he found out he had been rejected. What began with the compassion of Jesus ends with the compassion that Jesus can only bring. You see, the religious leaders rejected this man. They, they, they rejected him, and it hurts to be rejected by others. It hurts to be rejected by those we grew up with, those who we think are our friends, those who are our family members. It hurts to be rejected, but I have a question for you. Because God has a consolation for us in who Jesus is. And the question is this. If Jesus finds you, and if Jesus receives you, what does it matter who rejects you? If Jesus will drop everything, because I'm sure Jesus was probably pretty busy. He didn't have to go find this man who had been kicked out of the church. But if the God of the universe will step down from his glory, will seek after you, will chase you, will find you, will give his all so that you can be saved. What does it matter what the world thinks about you? That's a lesson that took me a long time to learn. That's a lesson. I was talking about how I haven't always been this knowledgeable of Scripture. Well, the truth is I haven't always been this confident when it came to sharing faith or preaching. I have students who say, wow, how can you stand up there and do it? Well, for the first good 10 years of ministry, I couldn't. Even as a young youth pastor, I was afraid to give my all in a sermon, to preach the truth, to tell people how it is, to share how much God loves me. I don't know why I was afraid, but I was afraid. But church, let me ask you this again. If God finds you and receives you, what does it matter who can reject you? And the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't matter because Jesus will find you. He will receive you and he will ask you. Do you believe? And when you say yes, you will get to worship at the feet of God. And all your worries, all your sicknesses, all your doubts and unbeliefs will slowly be taken away because your focus won't be turned on them anymore, but they will be turned on who Jesus is. If you want to go ahead. I love this, this ending because Jesus asked him that question. And when he says yes, Jesus reveals more of himself to him. And he indeed confirms that he is Christ. You know, one of the, the hardest parts I see of new Christians is we, we try to share our faith with them. And they say, well, if only I knew a little bit more, I'd be willing to do this. If only I knew who, who Jesus, how Jesus is going to come through in this situation, I'd be more willing to come to the altar and give my life. But what we see here is a pattern we see throughout the Bible. This blind man took the first step. He took the step, and he was kicked out of the church. And he took a step toward Jesus, and then Jesus revealed more of himself to the man who was once blind. See, there's so many times in my life where I have craved more of Jesus, where I've wanted more, where I've seen someone worshiping across the room, and I'm like, how do I get there? Well, the answer is simple. Take the first step take the first step and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to worship at the feet of Jesus. I'm ready to step out of my comfort zone. I'm ready to know exactly what God can do in my life. I'm not afraid to step out and do it. I'm not afraid to be transformed. I'm not afraid to step out of this building, to go out into my workplace, into my family, where people are running from God and show them exactly who God is and what he has done in my life. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. And in verse 38, it says he worshiped him church, let me tell you, there is nothing greater 
in life than getting the opportunity to stand before God and worship at his feet. There is nothing greater. And, and I'm sure many of you have experienced a lot more life than me. But one of the hardest parts of ministry, especially ministering to young adults or to teenagers, is explaining this to them, that there's nothing greater than worshiping Jesus. Because they're like, oh, but, but, but we really enjoy life. Uh, I've had teenage girls say, I want to get married before God comes back. I want to have kids. I want to get to do this. But I'm sure some of you can relate with this. When you faced life, when you've been blind and been in darkness, when you've seen your loved ones run from God, when you've seen your loved ones lay in bed sick and dying, when you've had the, the, the worries that this world brings, the money issues, the problems, when you've lost friends and family members, suddenly those things that the world can give that bring happiness become less important. And you realize the most important the most awesome thing I can do is worship Jesus at his feet because that's where I'm home. That's where I can finally feel at peace. But church, I want to close today with this. Are you blind today? And there's two sides of this. Because there are people who are blind because they haven't experienced the fullness of the joy of Jesus Christ. Maybe your eyes are open a little bit. But some of the stuff I said today, you haven't understood because you're like, something's still missing inside of me. I still haven't given up something or I still haven't taken that next step. Part of me is still blind and today I want to open my eyes and I want to see the truth. I want to know who Jesus is and I want to see him transform my life. See, some of us are blind because we haven't seen the full truth. But church, today some of us are blind because we've chosen to close our eyes and forget about the truth. Some of us are the blind man today and some of us are the ones who are the Pharisees today. And let me tell you this, I'm not judging you for either one. I don't care if you're the Pharisee who's been judging someone your entire life, who looks at your son or daughter and say it's their fault that they're there, they can bring themselves out of it. I don't care and God doesn't care because today God is saying it's time to take step out of that to realize who I've been and instead today start being the man who was once blind but can now see to go back to those loved ones and say I don't care how you got in that sin what I know today is that my God has the power has the authority to bring you out of it to bring you out of this darkness and in this pain that you are in, to pull you out of it and bring you into the light so you can stand firm in the knowledge of salvation, who is Jesus Christ.